Hi, I'm Tracy. Um, I put this up here because a lot of people think on Twitter, I love using Twitter, and I will tweet out the slides later, but a lot of people think I'm Lime Darling, and I'm Lime Daring. Um, I also own the Lime Darling account. That's kind of hilarious. I try to make it very obvious. Um, but afterwards, I'll tweet out the slides. Uh, there are some resources I mentioned pretty quickly um, in this talk, available on the slides, tweeted, et cetera, and so forth. So Lime Daring. So a little bit about, about my background and how I got to this place. Um, I went to school, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I actually originally went to Cal Poly for computer science. And the computer science, uh, they were teaching Java. And long story short, a year and a half, I rage quit, thought I hated programming, thought I hated tech, and I switched over to an art degree and in graphic design. Then, four years later, I had this idea, I'm just working as a web designer, and I had an idea for a, pro, uh, for a website I wanted to build. So I did the natural thing, I was like, I don't know how to program, I don't know how to do tech, um, I'm an idea person, or whatever. <laughs> and I wrote this post, trying to find a co-founder, another long story short, uh, that went horribly. And I was faced with the decision of, you know, quitting everything and just becoming a designer again, or learning how to program after that awful experience with Java. So I taught myself how to program. I started working with Python and Django. I built this site. Um, this was seven years ago, and it turned into a startup. It got into 500 startups. Um, it's, the website's still running. It's called Wedding Lovely. Uh, it's one of the best experiences I ever had in my life, going from you know, learning how to program. Python is so much better than Java, uh, especially to a person like me. And as I learned how to teach, I learned how to program, and I actually figured out the way that I like to be taught uh, I figured out, I was thinking that why, was, why were things taught in this way when it could be taught this way? So that's when I jumped into writing. And it's funny because if I go back and look at my, my um, go back to college and talk to my former self and I said, hey, in 10 years, you will be A, giving conference talks on writing, B, have two books yourself published, um, wrote two whole books. I would have thought you were absolutely insane because I am terrible at writing. However, the act of writing has been one of the best things that I've ever done for my career. Um, writing these books, writing blog posts, working in documentation, um, getting at least uh, all this stuff I've learned from writing, tried to distill it down into this talk. Because, you know, when we're working in tech, you, if you're like me and you hate writing, you hate grammar and all that kind of stuff, you still have to write at some point, whether it's documentation, you know, read me's for your, for your project. And that's really important for, for documentation because the better your documentation is, the more users you get, the less support requests you get, and hopefully more contributors. But I want to make a note that these tips work for pretty much all writing. Um, because you're not going to be just writing documentation. You could be writing, say, the about page on your, home, on your website. Or you could be writing the install instructions or your home page text for your project. So we can't escape writing. And I want to help you write better, in a, write in a way that makes people more excited uh, makes, uh, about your project and makes it so your writing is better understood. So we're definitely not going to talk grammar. I can't even speak correctly normally. Uh, and my writing, my, my, the grammar in my writing is awful. I'm not going to talk about grammar. A lot of people can probably nitpick on my slides. I'm not going to talk about design. There's so much I can say about how documentation and your writing can be laid out as a designer. I'm always like, oh. But we're not going to talk design. We're simply going to talk about content. Specifically, how can we make our content, your technical writing, and our documentation, easy to read and enjoyable. Whoop, go back. All right, so part one, creating friendly and welcoming writing. The number one thing that I want you to remember from this presentation, if you're gonna remember one thing, is that your readers are not you. Now it could be really tempting, and this is what I do sometimes too. You sit down and you're like, all right, cool, I'm gonna start writing about this this so-and-so project, or start writing my blog post, or start writing my documentation. And the person in your brain is another version of you, and you're, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I understand this, this is understandable to me, so it's good. However, 
the people reading your documentation, because this is the web. People can be coming from anywhere, from different backgrounds, with different experiences. You're writing for someone fundamentally different than yourself. And a lot of people, you know, this, there's uh, expert advanced level writing suffers from this a lot. A lot of people I talk to, you know, when they're writing for advanced, they say, hey, to, be, to use my project, you need to have a certain set of knowledge. And then they start skimping out on instructions because they believe that certain set of knowledge should already exist before they write their, you know, they write their content. Um, so they write it drier, shorter, uh, because it's for expert level content. The thing is, someone can get to expert advanced levels um, in so many different ways. Someone could be expert advanced in so-and-so um, area and um, less so in another. And when you're creating advanced and expert content, that's especially where you need to be aware that people can come in from your project from so many different areas with different backgrounds, and it's better to be more inclusive and opening in your writing or documentation, assuming not everyone knows everything that you do. So number one to help combat this is write like a human, not a machine. And that's when, like, write friendly, write more, like, like you're a person talking to another person, walking them through um, what you're writing. I take this to the extremes. This is my, uh, um, my dedication in my first book. And I not only use words that don't exist, but I even talk about peeing in the dedication. And I did this because I wanted someone to open up my programming books and come to this first page and be like, ah, this does not take itself seriously. Because so many learn to program books are just so dry. They take themselves so seriously that they're intimidating. And I calm it down a little bit within the actual text. But there's still things in there like woohoo and all those you know, things that you know, a professional writer might look at this and be like, why is that in there? That's totally unprofessional. But when I'm talking to people reading the books, having these, when you're talking about this like, uh, hard to understand, very intimidating topic like learning how to code, being more friendly and having little woohoos and having little bits of personality shine through writing, even though that technically is not like very professional, uh, makes my writing more accessible to more people. So you might want to like, start writing like a human and have a conversation with someone. But when you do so, make sure you don't add cultural references that might not translate to other cultures. So I'm going to call out my friend, Kenneth kind of Reitz, who does requests. And the very first line of requests says, request is the only non-GMO HTTP library for Python, say, for human consumption. <laughs> so we all know that's a joke. But maybe someone from another culture, or maybe someone who's looking at this um, translated to a different language might be thinking to themselves, are there packages that are not safe for human consumption? <laughs> so that's the first line in this, this project's documentation on their um, install instructions uh, can lead to a question. Not, probably not the best thing to lead out with. So one of the ways to help you write more like a human, right, like a conversation to someone else, is to create a persona. Write for someone other than yourself. So think to yourself, what would Fred, a designer working on his first programming project need to know when coming to, uh, to my project and try to write for that person. So I mean, Request has, has really good writing within um, the other pages of their websites. You know, this one is particularly nice. I like how this is phrased, where it says, this document discusses the various kinds of authentication with requests. Many web services require authentication, and there are many different types. Below, we outline various forms of authentication available in requests from the simple to the complex. So that's short, that's easy to understand, that's more conversational. It's a really nice way to introduce that page. For another example, this is the URL Up 3 uh, documentation, uh, which is actually run by my husband. And I like how in the beginning it says, hey, go to urlib3.readadocs.org for more syntax highlighted examples. But long story short, Here's how to install. So those little like bits of conversation, those kind of uh, those phrases are really act, like open and friendly, and they're really nice to see and read. Reads more like a human, not a machine. Another thing about terms 
not just cultural references, but remember that terms that might be obvious to you might not be obvious to others. Um, again, with advanced or expert level documentation, this especially uh, could, um, this problem could arise. So for example, let's take, let's look at a whole different uh, area like recipes. I, partic I cook, and I, I've been cooking for pretty much my entire life, and I understand what recipes say because I have experience. But if you don't have experience, you might get really concerned and kind of confused about the terms they're using, like cream the butter, which is like, isn't butter already cream? Trust the bird, fold the egg whites, render the fat, and then my particular favorite, shock the vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not used to cooking, you might be like, what the heck do these mean? And recipes are particularly bad because they just rely on someone to go on and Google what these terms mean. But we don't have to do that. And I reckon, you know, let's not do that um, with our documentation. So if there's anything that you don't want to like, explain, you don't want to go into a ex like, full paragraph of what you mean by trust the bird, you can link to anything you don't want to explain. This is so simple, and so many things, places miss this. So for Laravel's documentation, they say, hey, Laravel uses Composer, and Composer is linked. If this wasn't linked, Laravel would be saying, hey, if you don't know what Composer is, you shouldn't be here. But when there's a link there, it says, hey, if you don't know what this is, go ahead and click this link, read more, and come back. It's just a little simple thing that you can do for any kind of term that you might think won't be understood by 100% of your readers, just go ahead and link it up. Now, when it comes to installation instructions, uh, this is a really great blog post, and I'm just going to pull out a little bit of it. But essentially, when it comes to installation instructions or walking someone through a port part of your website or your project, um, teach, don't tell. Don't say, hey, just go read the source. For example, the son says, hey, dad, you said you're going to teach me how to drive after school a day. Are we still going to do that? The father, without looking up from his iPad, replies, of course, son. The car is in the garage, and I laid out a set of wrenches on the workbench. Take the car apart, look at each piece, and put it back together. And when you've done that, I'll take you to the DMV for your driving test. This is what you're saying to a beginner when you say, hey, go read the source. Reading the source works for someone who's already uh, familiar with your project, already has experience with the project, they can go in and really deep dive into the details. But your writing and documentation about your project needs to get them to that point. I particularly like how the Django REST framework has their project set up, set up instructions. Oops, excuse me. They not only give you an explanation about, you know, a, a quick start about how to get started with them, but they even walk you through creating the folder um, starting the virtual environment, you know, installing Django, and then setting up Django REST framework. They don't assume that you have this experience beforehand, and people who have experience can't skip those instructions, but they're there to walk someone through. So, I mean, kind of a bad phrase, but like dumb things down, but you know, don't make them dumb. Just walk someone through installation, hold their hand. It doesn't have to be that long or tedious. The Fabric in, um, instructions, it starts out with a really great introduction, where the first paragraph is, hey, what's, flat? What, excuse me, what's, um, what's Fabric? The second paragraph is what it does, and the third paragraph is typical use. And then it goes directly into how to use it and the kind of output you get. This is a really, really simple and easy to understand introduction to this project. And even more advanced when it comes to hand-holding is Stripe's documentation. So I popped over to Stripe, uh, and right when I started, when I, I, was, I was looking at their website and things started moving, because they have an animated GIF. So I'll show you. It started filling out, and it, and it said submit, and it gives you something to paste into your command line. At this point, I'm like, OK. So you take it over to your command line, you run it, and it comes back with the response. And then the website automatically updated. And I was like, what? So then I took the other thing, um, grabbed the other parts, had paste that into command line, 
walking you through the process of working with Stripe without touching any code, just copying and pasting. Stripe is magic. So at the end, at the end it says, hey, great. Now you can, uh, you can create your first charge, create your first subscription, but this is like, as an introduction into Stripe, A is magical and person goes, ooh, and then B shows how easy it, used, it is to use a Stripe. So that takes a lot more work to set up something like that, those kind of installation instructions, that kind of magic. But as an introduction, as being you know, welcoming to people coming to Stripe, it's pretty awesome. So quick note on gendered language. Um, it is really easy to take out gendered language from your, uh, from your documentation, and I highly encourage you to do so. Um, a, you can avoid controversy. I don't know if anyone saw this happen, um, but it ended up being 228 uh, comments, fights between many people, causing a lot of pain. And it's really easy to take out gender language from your, from your project. So this resource is, literally gives you examples of a sentence and then how you can fix that sentence. So if you're struggling with removing gendered pronouns from your writing, and let me tell you, I notice whenever I see uh, gender pronouns. For example, I mean, tech has gotten really good about this, but I work a lot in startups as well. And I'm often, like something like hack, uh, Y Combinator or Startup School, of like a thousand person auditorium will be one of 20 there. I notice when writing says, in entrepreneurship, says, hey, the startup does this, and then he does this. And every time I'm just like, ah. Oh because I'm fighting so much to, to feel like a part of this culture, and then seeing that, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm being left out again. I mean, it's important to me, um, and it's really easy to fix, and this resource. Uh, if you just Google for gender-neutral technical writing, you probably can find it as well. So when it comes to writing, you might be thinking, okay, how do I make sure, how do I know whether this is, uh, how this is working or not? and you might get, get a little overwhelmed. First off, take a break. Just write, and then walk away. Um, come back to it later, and you might be able to notice if there's places you can be more clear, um, or there's places that you uh, uh, might need to update. And then you can also have a friend review your writing. Just having a second pair of eyes on your writing, your installation instructions, et cetera, um, can help you determine whether your writing is working. And then a quick bit in terms of writing clearly. And this particularly works for all writing. So when it comes to writing, make sure to cut down your content. And a good rule of thumb is two or three um, sentences per paragraph. Long, big paragraphs are really intimidating. And people on the web don't read giant paragraphs, they skim. And if you can't break up your, your long paragraphs, Break your par uh, shorten your paragraphs, break them into bullets and add lots of headers. Make things easy to skim, because when people are skimming your website, they're gonna land on certain parts of your writing. So headers, the first sentence of a paragraph, um, and then read further if they're interested. And you can add more places that I could catch by adding italics and bolding in order to highlight parts of your paragraphs. So to illustrate this, you have the, sentence, the paragraph on the right, or excuse me, left, um, and we just added some bullets on the right. And by adding bullets, again, for someone who's skimming, gives the eye a place to hop in between, meaning that they're more likely to see the, the important parts of this paragraph rather than the left, which is a little hard to go through. But we can further improve readability by adding some bolding and creating a larger header. So we can see that now the right, again, is even more uh, skimmable. It's easier for someone to skim and see those highlighted parts. And if you can, add spacing. This is a designer in me. But having, adding some spacing in here is kind of breaking up some of the clutter, making it easier to read. Don't forget your headlines, though. And a lot of people, uh, you, you know, headlines A are really good for, again, skimmers to go t in between the different sections of your content because people skim. Just remember, people skim. People do not read content on the web. So adding headlines between all the important sections um, is gonna give someone a place, an, a place for the eye to rest. 
And make sure that when you're thinking about the length of your content, you're also looking at the length and the clarity of your headlines as well. And then specifically about simplifying your language. Uh, one thing that's often forgotten, I mentioned this really briefly earlier, um, one of the biggest important, one of the most important what reasons to simplify your language is because people could be coming to your website and running it through Google Translate. You know, there's the, the Translate that's automatically installed in Chrome, um, or, you know, googletranslate.com, et cetera, and so forth. But by breaking up the thesaurus and using really big, um, complicated words might sound smart, but they're less likely to be translated correctly. So, you know, not only use simple language, shorten your sentences and make them easier to read um, for your English readers, but also for people coming in from a different language. And quick side note about code snippets, uh, make sure that they're styled differently. And if you're, you know, hosting your documentation on something like Write the Docs, this is probably already done for you. Um, but just in case you're doing this yourself um, on your own system, make sure you're using like a different font, usually a monospace font, kind of break the code parts out from the rest of the text and makes them easier to read. So this is my book, again, um, and I, putting this up to shame myself because really um, I wish I had a code uh, highlighting, code color highlighting onto this text. But at the very least, um, the bits of the code are in a monospace font and they're a different color than the rest of the text to make sure that they stand out and they look like code. But like I said, it's probably better for, to make sure that the color highlighting, um, code color highlighting is, uh, is in your documentation because it makes it easier to read. And if possible, add file names to your code blocks if it makes sense. Um, so again, the books, because I'm going through specific parts, specific files, um, put on there saying, hey, this is based on HTML. You might be referenced in the text, but it's always good to have a secondary reminder saying, hey, this part of this, this code needs to go into this file. And also happens with Django, uh, where it says, hey, in your you know, uh, poll slash URLs of Pi do this, in your my site that URL slash URL is a pi did this. Just having that secondary hint that this is where this code is going to go um, can be super helpful. And we talked about content and writing, but don't forget pictures and screenshots and GIFs. Because illustrating your instructions, your what you're trying to document, um, super helpful, especially for people who are more visual learners like I am. So in Shopify, they have this you know, step-by-step -step process where it says, hey, log into your dashboard, click development stores, click create a new store. And then right there, they have a screenshot showing you where that button is for create a new, shore, create a new store. And then they take it one step further in this, in this other page, where not only do they say, hey, go ahead, click on settings, and click sales channel, they have the text installation instructions to walk you through this process, but they also have a GIF to show you exactly where everything is. So that means that someone coming into your project, reading the instructions, will both have the text instructions which they read, but also a visual like, reminder of what they're looking for, which is awesome. Please use photos and text and um, photos and screenshots as much as possible. So in conclusion, remember that your readers have different backgrounds and experiences than you. Remember that people could be coming to your project uh, you know, with knowledge in one area and not, not a lot of knowledge in another area, and it's better overall to, to make sure that your text has the appropriate links, the appropriate explanations. Um, understand that you know, even if you're an advanced level project, that people could be coming to your project just to read and learn, and it's better to be more inclusive than exclusive with your writing. Be friendly and write like a human. Don't be afraid to show personality, some conversation um, within your text and your documentation. It makes you look more friendly and, and makes things a little bit more fun to read. Remember to simplify. And this applies to length. This applies to word choice. This applies to your layout. This applies to everything. Try to just simplify things down, make them simple, and make them easy and under easily understood. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I should be around for questions later. Thank you. <laughs>